Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Given that most people in the present probably know about Plutarch mainly as a writer of biographies, the parallel lives as well as some other biographies, it's, it's entirely reasonable that we would expect to find some biographical material or at least mentions in Plutarch's short work on controlling anger, and he does not disappoint. As a matter of fact, he's going to tell us about quite a few people from ancient times, and we should think about why bring these sorts of things up. They are examples that we can emulate, that we can think about, that we can mull over, so to speak. We could even model ourselves after them to, to some degree. And Plutarch himself is going to tell us that I always strive to collect, sunagin, to bring together, and to peruse or to, you know, more literally think about um, anagignoskin, the, the, not just the sayings and the deeds of the philosophers, but of other people as well. Now, he's got a very funny thing that he says here about fools, or literally those who do not possess mind or intellect. Uh, these people say that philosophers lack bile. And you might say, well, that sounds like a medical problem to me. Bile, holos, was associated with anger. And so, you know, the philosophers lacking that would actually be better off than the rest of us because they don't get provoked, you know, by their bodily reactions into anger. Plutarch thinks that that is completely wrong, right? Philosophers can get angry too. He knows plenty of philosophers. He interacts with them. Uh, but he's saying, I don't want to just look at philosophers who at that time would have been the people to give most of the advice, philosophers, playwrights, other, other people who are considered wise about how to control anger. I want to look at people who have to deal with anger all the time, who don't have special training in this. And so he says, I'm not only going to look at the sayings and deeds of the philosophers, I'm not going to put those aside, but even more those of kings, uh, you know, Basileon and despots or tyrants, Turanon. And, you know, what's the difference between these? Well, a king is a better kind of ruler than a tyrant, but they're both monarchical. They're both one person rule, right? So he's going to look at these and try to draw some useful examples or even conclusions from them. He doesn't actually begin with Philip of Macedon. But I think that we should, because he talks about Philip uh, so often. And so he begins by talking about this guy, um, Arcadian the Achaean, who was always railing against Philip. Philip was trying to unite all of Greece underneath the Macedonian monarchy. And then, you know, to create an army that then he would take to fight Persia, which is what his son Alexander will do. And so Arcadian, the Achaean, is always railing against Philip, right? And so when Arcadian visited Macedonia, he's going into uh, enemy territory. Philip's friends thought that he should not be let off, but punished. What does Philip do? Philip does the exact opposite. He meets him. He treats him kindly. He sends him presents. 
gifts. He tells his friends later to ask how Arcadian now spoke of him to the Greeks. And here is where the friends turned out to be wrong and Philip turned out to be right. The friends are saying, oh, well, he says good things about you now. It looks like you won him over. And so Philip says, I'm a better physician. I'm a better doctor than you. Isn't, isn't that an interesting way to frame it? It's viewing anger as a, a medical problem or conflict as well, not giving into it. Uh, another case, um, Philip is being, you know, defamed again. Uh, blasphemias is literally the term there being, you know, they're saying nasty things about him. Uh, in Olympia. And so some people said the Greeks should uh, pay for it because they spoke evil of Philip, even though they were being well treated. And then Philip says, well, what would they say if they were being badly treated? So he's able to brush it off with kind of a comparison and a joke, right? Um, a little bit later on, uh, he says, just as someone said of Philip when he'd raised the city of Olynthus to the ground, but he could not possibly repopulate a city so large. Uh, he says, um, Plutarch says, you can address anger and say you're able to overturn and destroy and throw down, but to raise up and preserve and spare and forbear is the work of mildness and forgiveness and moderation in passion, the work of a Camillus or Metellus or Aristides or a Socrates, but to attach oneself to the wound and sting as the part of an ant or a horsefly. So even Philip sometimes gives in, but we see that, you know, much of the time it's possible to display these other attitudes, to raise up, to preserve, to spare, to refrain from, right? These are the works, as he says, of mildness, praotetos, and uh, forgiveness, sun gnomes, being forgiving towards other, understanding towards other, and a measured amount of the passion, metriopatheas. So Philip furnishes us some, some interesting uh, examples and talking points. Who else does Plutarch bring up? This guy Antigonus with his men, they're saying bad things about him once again near his tent. He can hear them. They're off on campaigns. And he says, listen, buddies, go over there so I can't hear you reviling me. Uh, go further off to abuse me. Why? Because he knows that he's liable to get angry with them uh, if he keeps listening to this. Ptolemy has uh, another interesting example here. Ptolemy is one of the uh, successors of Alexander. And uh, Ptolemy is making fun of a scholar, a pedant, it's actually translated here, grammaticon, uh, a, a grammar teacher, right, for being uh, ignorant. And then the, um, the grammar teacher says, I shall tell you, he asked him, who is Peleus' father? He says, I'll tell you if you'll tell me who is the father of Lagos. And this is a joke that he's making about the um, perhaps illegitimate uh, birth, the conception of Ptolemy himself. He might have been Philip of Macedon's kid. And so, you know, people are like, oh, we're going to punish this guy. And Ptolemy says, listen, uh, a king shouldn't, make jokes if he can't take jokes. So if you're going to abuse somebody else in a joking way, you got to be able to roll with it when other people do that to you instead of getting angry as you are on my behalf. Uh, he also talks about this guy Porus. He's taken captive by Alexander, who was subject to fits of rage and temper. And Alexander asks him how he, uh, or T Taurus says, uh, treat me like a king, meaning don't treat me as if I'm a king. Act like a king yourself, Alexander. And Alexander said, is there nothing more? And Porus says, in the words, like a king, there is everything. Why? Because the king of the gods, Zeus, is the gentle one right? The Athenians call him boisterous, but punishment is the work of the furies and spirits, not of the high gods and Olympian deities. So he's saying, don't just act like a king, 
act like a God king. That means be, be gentle, be forgiving, be decent with me. Plutarch is also going to bring up a number of examples of people not allowing anger to interfere with their work, their goals, their activities in conflict, particularly in war. And so he talks about um, this Roman general, uh, you know, the, the Rhodian says to the Roman general servant, what you say matters nothing to me, but what your master doesn't say. He brings up Sophocles and, uh, you know, Neoptolemus, who's a hero. Um, they're trying to do things, go into battle without being angry. And he talks about um, barbarians poisoning their, their weapons. True bravery has no need of this because it's been dipped in reason, but rage and fury are rotten and easily broken. And then he talks about the Spartans going into battle uh, without being angry, playing pipes to remove from their fighting men the spirit of anger. You might say, well, what's that about? I mean, these strongest of warriors, at least until the Thebans beat them, um, why are they trying to remove anger? Because anger is not as effective for warfare as is reason, right? He's got uh, several other great examples. Agathles is engaging in a siege and people are like, how are you going to pay for your mercenaries? And he's like, well, after they sack your city, I'm going to pay him out of that. He refuses to get angry. He responds to an insult with a joke. Um, Antigonus, when some of the men on the wall of a town are jeering at him because he's got a deformity, he says, I thought my face was handsome. And then he gets the last laugh. He takes the town. He sells the people as slaves who were joking at him, jeering at him. And he says, well, you know, if you're going to insult me again, I'll talk to your masters. And so all of these people are able to um, avoid falling into the foolishness that comes out of getting angry and losing control. The last thing that he talks about in terms of like real life examples, um, orators and advocates need to avoid getting angry because they become ineffective. They make mistakes in their task of using language to convince when they allow themselves to get angry. So he brings up this guy, uh, the friends of Satyrus, the Samian, when he was going to plead a case, would stop up his ears with wax so he wouldn't screw things up by getting angry at the insults of his enemies, saying things while he's trying to present his case. So these are all a number of good examples from ancient times that Plutarch thinks would be helpful for his readers in figuring out how to respond when people are trying to push your buttons, people are trying to provoke you, people are trying to get you to get angry and thereby to do foolish things, to lose control, probably to take revenge that you shouldn't take rather than reconciling and removing the conflicts. We could come up with additional examples in our own time. Obviously, Plutarch lived, you know, over 2,000 years ago. Uh, well, not quite 2,000 years ago, but uh, close to two millennia ago. So, you know, some of his examples are a little bit harder for us to relate to. But if we think about the general ideas that are involved in this and we mull them over, I think that we can actually derive a lot of useful reflections from that.